Thanks very much. So I'd like to, uh, I think we should, we should start. We've got a, a long day ahead with a lot of tributes to uh, Karen coming up. And um, this celebration of Karen's academic career is being held on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. And I want to acknowledge them as the traditional owners. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and the elders from other communities who are here today. So this is going to be a, a very interesting day, obviously. There are a lot of speeches, um, tributes to Karen. So I've been asked to open the show and I was told to try and be um, a little bit you know, comical and make it, make it <laughs> interesting. And I felt that I didn't want to cover the ground that other people um, would be covering uh, later on. Um, Karen uh, is someone, we away with the slides. So uh, Karen, Karen is uh, someone who uh, is very special, not only to the individuals here, but as a, uh, I guess, a national Australian uh, icon. And um, some, some years ago now, <laughs> I can't even see the slides myself anymore. The, 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 the exact date, but it's like about 14 or 15 years ago, she was nominated as the Australian, one of the Australians of the year for um, the Northern Territory. But her career has spread uh, throughout Australia. Um, she's moved around Australia uh, to many different places and, and had major influences uh, on many people, even in this room. Um, some of her papers are, are legendary and, and highly cited, uh, but I'm going to leave most of that information um, to the um, um, following speakers. Um, this is one of my favourite slides, and I, I just want to give a little general background. Um, it was in the Herald Sun, or as it was then about 20 years ago, which showed the uh, Collingwood football team uh, and the, uh, one of the indigenous football teams, the Rovers, um, pointing out that some 20 years later or more that um, only three of the indigenous footballers were still alive, yet all of those Collingwood footballers were uh, all alive and well. And I think that is, you know, a, a beautiful illustration of the, the gap which um, <laughs> came into some... Con controversial um, points yesterday um, when they announced the, the annual report or that Turnbull did. So to a certain extent, um, Karen, um, <laughs> I've labelled this the preacher because she's been uh, someone who's pushed very hard the nutritional message uh, to both the general community and, of course, uh, in her terrific work with the Indigenous community and there are many very interesting studies like the Luma study and such like where she's um, aimed to change patterns of behaviour and eating and, and, and the foods available uh, and such like. And I think that um, there are very few people uh, in the country who have had uh, such an impact in this particular area. Most of them appear in the newspapers with statements but Karen's out there in the field making changes. Now this, so there was another preacher many years ago, and I thought you might appreciate this. this is a slide <laughs> I was just given, uh, who uh, really didn't understand the changes that were happening in the community. Uh, but, um, and I hope there's no one here with any uh, re religious folk. I was actually worried that this, meeting was going to be at St Vincent's Hospital and I may not be able to get away with this, but... <laughs> so, we're... Um, you're, you're wondering, well, I'm showing a, a study, a Sandrat study, actually, uh, where we... Um, I brought out Sandrats to Australia about uh, 25, 30 years ago because I thought that they would be a fantastic model to demonstrate um, that a change in diet and exercise would actually uh, prevent diabetes. 
Um, I was really thrilled about this. It cost me a lot of money to import them into the country. And just when I'm in the middle of this workout comes this incredible study, <laughs> which I'm sure you'll see this picture many times today, this study by Karen, um, which really what you'd have to rec you'd have to regard it as probably the first important study uh, in humans uh, showing that lifestyle change could actually reduce not only diabetes but the risk factors for heart disease, etc. And I'm sure there are other people who are going to be talking about this today, so I won't go into it uh, in any more detail. Um, it's been highly cited. I think every paper I write, I cite that article. And if you're not citing it in your own papers now, you're missing something. And we'd like to see the, the levels of citations <laughs> increase. Um, and now today in, in America, in Finland, Japan, India, many countries now, there are these huge programs, very costly programs. And even more recently, there's a guy, I think, Michael... Um, Manly or something like that, uh, who's on television here telling everyone if they lose weight, um, you can stop or prevent the diabetes or reverse it. And this, all this stuff was done um, almost 30 years ago by Karen. And so I think she needs a very big recognition um, for that particular work. Now, I organised with George Alberti some years ago now, I think it was back in 2003, a meeting... Uh, for the International Diabetes Federation, looking at um, type 2 diabetes in children. We saw it was going to be a problem. Karen was one of the key speakers. Uh, this was the title uh, of her paper. And indeed, um, th she made the very important point, again, so many years before anyone else, of the importance of the intrauterine effects uh, during diabetes um, on the future um, direction of the, uh, the children in terms of their development and the potential to develop diabetes. Now, she also lectured very strongly on food supply and what were the right things to eat, but I caught her at morning tea uh, looking... <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, again, another area where Karen was far ahead of the field. Now, I wanted you to see this slide because this is a slide by a mob Blatz who made beer, actually, in Milwaukee. And they were... I should actually read it in case, in case you can't see it. How mother and baby picked up. A case of Blatz beer in your home means much to the young mother and obviously baby participates in its benefits. <laughs> The malt in the beer supplies nourishing qualities that are essential at this time and the hope to act as appetising, stimulating, stimulating tonic. <laughs> now, you know, that, that was, the, uh, that was the sort of that, what prevailed at the time. And Bob Hawke in 1990 came out with a study, or he claimed that by 1990, he did this in the 80s, that by 1990, every child in Australia would be born healthy. So Bob, he got a lot of criticism for it. He was, uh, I'd say, right for the wrong reason, etc. And now the very big issue in terms of type 2 diabetes, and again, Karen was very early in the, in, in the area here, was the whole issue of intergenerational risk and fetal programming and the importance of a healthy pregnancy and the fact that these risk factors all, and we know not only in the ladies in Turak, but also in the indigenous community throughout Australia and in fact throughout the world, that early development is a major issue and one of the major drivers of the diabetes, obesity and cardiovascular epidemic. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that Karen was there at the start and there's mounting evidence now that the changes, that the epigenetic changes that occur during the pregnancy are intergenerational and this risk gets carried on through generations um, because of the fact. And something that we try to put to the Australian government in terms of the, um, the diabetes epidemic here and in China and other countries, the importance of a healthy uh, pregnancy.
Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was the very famous uh, Ausdiab study, which you're all aware of, which showed there were a million people with diabetes in Australia when we did it in the year 2000. Um, we now think that over 1.7 million people in Australia. We went <coughs> around all the states. Karen was responsible for our work in the Northern Territory. She's seen here right at the front uh, of the Ausdiab consortium that we set up to do the study. And a slide that I think has in, been in every presentation except when I go to Darwin because they've seen it so often, um, is this particular slide which shows diabetes in the uh, Australian community, and I think even Neville Owen was at the front of that um, picture there, actually. Um, the, the yellow gold is the Ausdiab rates by age, and you can see two Indigenous communities there, um, or one Torres Strait Island, the other Aboriginal, the blue one. And you can see in the blue the fall-off in the number of people with diabetes or the prevalence with age. And that's not because less people are getting diabetes, that's because they're dying. And this is, again, one of the very important slides that is shown around the country, demonstrating the huge gap. And Alex Brown, of course, is producing more data on this, um, but the, the huge gap between the um, white or European community and the indigenous community. And of course, to finish, Karen has been a mover and a shaker. There's no question about it. In case none of you read the Oxford Dictionary, a, a mover and a shaker is a powerful person who initiates events and influences people. And she's influenced very much um, Alex Brown, obviously, who's one of the most creative and outstanding figures now uh, in the world of Indigenous diabetes. I think Alex is with us today. And you can see here she's starting to shake Alex to get him, <laughs> to, get it, to get him m moving. And I thought you'd appreciate this, that that mover you headhunted for me turned out to be a shaker. <laughs> and that's very much the case. So look, finally, I think we're all here to not to actually wish Karen um, to dramatically ride into the West, I think that she's going to contribute and continue contribu contribute. And there's, she's left a very strong imprint on how many of us think, uh, not only about general nutritional health, but the health and welfare of the Indigenous community. So um, with that introduction, Karen, um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. There'll be some stories about you which you may not wish to. <laughs> I, I guess that's why you're wearing those glasses so that you, you can't be recognised. And so it, it's my pleasure to, to actually um, call on Jenny Brand Miller, um, who's at the University of Sydney, um, equally well known in the nutrition area. And I'm, forgive me, the other speakers if I don't give you big introductions, because I think we ought to be spending the time talking about Karen today. So, Thank you. over to you, Jenny. Oh, sure. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. I feel so honoured to be here speaking now. Karen probably didn't realise it at the time, but she, she was a role model to me. An unconscious role model because she was out there as a woman in nutrition, just saying what she thought, um, moving places. I have a slide there. What she did for me was tell me that it was okay to push the envelope, the way she spoke at meetings. She didn't take any crap, sorry, from from any of the chairpersons, she let them know what she thought. And so, to me, what she was saying was, well, this is, this is how you act. You don't have to be frightened. You don't have to be a mouse. You can say what you think. So, what I'm going to do now is just go through what I call um, Karen's early work, um, because I'm assuming some of you um, here are so young that... <laughs> You, you uh, were born after these papers were published. <laughs> so, um, 
the trouble when you get to my age is you actually think a lot about your age and the fact that all the people around you were so young. Um, <laughs> they, they, some of them look like that they've, they haven't even left school and yet they're sometimes professors and associate professors. So I'm going to talk some of this early work and what I want to do each time is, is show you that we were actually working quite in parallel, even though we weren't directly working with each other. I don't know how it worked. We were just interested in the same things and we were publishing in the same way. So, and I want to show you how much she's influenced me. So, glucose homeostasis, everyone knows today that that's, that's the crux of the, the mechanisms behind why people get type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, particularly type 2 diabetes, because when glucose homeostasis is, um, is, is not behaving, then the risk of getting diabetes, for example, if HbA1c is above 6%, the relative risk is about 40 times, not 1.2 or 1.25, it's 40 times. And that's published in New England Journal of Medicine. So I think what Karen did was really push that idea early on before other people here in Australia were, were recognising the truth of it. So as, as Paul said, <laughs> we're going to see a lot of this paper. And, um, and it's the one I think that really put Karen on, on the map. And, and so it should because what she did was quite remarkable. Um, she she took a group of 10 Aboriginal people who had type 2 diabetes, were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at the time. Oh, I can see this now. Um, whose mean age was 53, um, overweight and obese. And they, she took them, I think, single-handedly back to the bush. <laughs> had a bit of help. Someone to take the blood samples, maybe. <laughs> Right. Okay, I'll say a little bit in the moment about that. And so what I wasn't sure is I know that according to the paper, the group lost an average of eight kilograms, which is a, a very fast weight loss. And today we know that kind of weight loss actually is associated with really remarkable changes in the beta cell. The, the beta cell mass shrinks in fast, rapid weight loss. And, and then when you start to refeed, all the stem cells in the beta cells begin to think, oh, so this is my chance. And so biogenesis is stimulated. So the beta cell mass builds up. So even if you regain the weight that you had lost, even if you do, you're, you're delaying or preventing the diagnosis of diabetes in the future. So um, she, one of the remarkable things she pointed out was that lean meat could be healthy. So she showed <laughs> that this is before the paleo diet, before the, the craze for high protein diets. We're looking at three decades ago. And, and even saying this was provocative, correct? It was provocative to say that lean red meat could be healthy. Um, and then there was an opportunity to collaborate with, with Karen and um, with Randy Spargo. And Randy's, Randy's name, I don't think I actually, actually ever met him. <laughs> Um, but I, I saw at that time when I was there, I saw these samples that were, were labelled for Karen O'Day. And um, that, that's the closest I got to her at that time, was actually seeing test tubes that were, um, were dedicated to her work. Um, so what we found, this was work um, with, with Anne Thorburn, who I thought might be here today. And Anne was the PhD student with me. So she's, she's the, th the third from your, your left. And um, next to her is the man who turned out to be her husband. And on either side, we have um, Philip Kuschel and myself. So we were actually the first um, academics to have a, a, a marriage take place during the PhDs. So we were quite proud of ourselves. Anyway, you can see here, circled, I've got the Aboriginal responses um, to potato, ordinary um, potatoes you find in the supermarket, and something that's called the bush potato, or it was actually a, some kind of cheeky yam. And you can see that 
bush potatoes producing a lower glucose response. Um, but the remarkable thing is that it's still higher than the glucose response um, that you see to Caucasians, which are the two lower curves. And that's the same sorry, that's the same when you come to insulin as well. So you can see the beta cells are really, really being pushed to deal with that carbohydrate load in Aboriginal people. So then what Karen did was explore the mechanisms. And this paper is, um, the first author is Joe Proito, who I thought might be here today. Yes, 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 yes. hello, Joe. <laughs> okay, so, so this early identification of metabolic defects in Australian Aborigines. So again, what you see is these glucose tolerance curves, which show you how, how far glucose homeostasis is being disturbed um, in when you consume 75 grams of um, glucose. And what we were trying to point out at the time was, well, you know, potatoes and other foods like rice and bread, even wholemeal bread, were pushing the beta cells to the same extent that there wasn't a lot of difference between um, these glucose loads and some of the starchy foods that were people were eating. And so there you see the insulin response. So it's no, not really a surprise that the beta cells begin, begin to fade after a time. And then um, she showed differences in glucose, to in glucose intolerance in Aborigines and in Caucasians and hyperinsulinemia and obesity. So behind this was the, the idea that it was actually the very high insulin levels that might have been driving the obesity, that insulin was a hormone and insulin resistance was making the problem even worse in terms of inhibiting fat oxidation and stimulating fat storage. So. Karen also did some work on the glycemic index, which is where I found myself um, focusing on. So the recognition that starches um, could be highly gelatinized, and you can see it so easily in a fluffy white bread. But fluffy white, fluffy wholemeal bread can do the same thing. So factors that affected the rate of hydrolysis in, of starch. So what happens during um, processing of food is really a black box. We don't know what's happening when you can foods, when you process them, um, unless you look under the microscope. And you can see then that the starch is being highly gelatinized. So it came back to the physical form of the carbohydrate. And you can see also there that we're looking at GIP responses, which today we're beginning to think GIP responses may be one of the mechanisms behind the harm that high GI foods do. Uh, factors affecting the rate of hydrolysis of starch in legumes. So we looked at canned leg legumes and showed even though they, they were being canned and that was you know highly processed legumes, they were still low GI, which is a good finding. Commercial canning increases the digestibility of beans, um, but they're still low GI. Food processing and maize variety affects the amount of starch that escapes um, into the large bowel, escapes the small intestine into the large bowel and um, provides food resistant starch for the microbiome. And then I think this is the last paper that I was really amazed at this. This is the time when we were saying that um, you know, fat is really, really bad. We had demonised fat, um, all kinds of fat. A low-fat diet was in and could do, could do no harm. But Karen published this paper that I found really extraordinary that fat in the form of olive oil, monounsaturated fat, actually improved your body composition. <laughs> I, I, I was so sceptical at the time. And, of course, now the Med Mediterranean diet is um, the diet that has the most solid mass of evidence to say it's associated with lower risk of CVD and type 2 diabetes as well. One more paper, sorry. One more paper. I loved it when I saw this paper. It was one of the first to suggest that starchy foods could be influencing the relative risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So it wasn't just the sugars. It wasn't just um, the lack of dietary fibre or the presence of dietary fibre. It was 
in fact, related to postprandial glycemia and starch. And then, like Paul, I went looking for photos of Karen on the internet, um, Google images, and I found a few that um, showed her immersed in the fruit and vegetable department of the supermarket. And the only other photo I thought, I thought, this is Karen at some sort of fancy dress. But this morning when I saw Karen, I thought, oh my God, she's wearing those glasses. <laughs> Oh, my God. And I thought, this is another example of what my husband calls my foot-in-mouth disease. <laughs> so, apologies. <laughs> apologies. Just another example that Karen pushes the envelope. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> so, th thank you, Julie. I... Uh, uh, you mentioned, actually, you asked if Joe Proetta was in the audience. Uh, I think we're all very glad to see Joe because, unfortunately, there's a death notice about three weeks ago um, of uh, someone with a very similar name. And we were all thinking, what happened? But for I shouldn't say fortunately. Unfortunately, it was... For, unfortunately, for the person concerned, it was Joe's, <laughs> Joe's second cousin. But uh, So, Joe, we're really delighted to see the, the legend here today. The other day I was at a lunch, it was the Australia Day lunch, and Australia Post honoured um, some legendary television stars, um, Bert Newton, Daryl Summers, uh, Delvina Delaney, uh, uh, what's her name, Cathy Keneally, or well, anyhow, they've produced stamps for them. And um, Jenny just mentioned that Kellen told people to push the envelope. See, so they said to ask Daryl Summers, uh, what do you think about being on a postage stamp now? And he said, I pushed the envelope all of my career. Now I'm on the front of it. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. So the, our next speaker is uh, Professor Richard Larkins. He is a legend in his own right. Um, he's been a great support, I think, of Karen through her career. He's mentored many people. He's, he, he's good in science, he's good in academia, good in uh, health system organisation, and he's going to give us a little talk about Karen and what he knows about her past. Thanks, Paul. I think looking around the audience and seeing how many people there are from so many different aspects of of academic life in Australia just shows the impact that uh, Karen's had over her career. And it's just wonderful to see so many old friends that I haven't seen for a, a long, long time. And uh, as, as uh, it's been referred to, Karen has been a great sort of bringing together of different groups. Rather than going through any of the technical aspects of uh, Karen's work, instead I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact that Karen had on a whole Department of the University of Melbourne when she arrived. <laughs> so I, I termed it a human hurricane because in many ways Karen had just, for four, just the degree of destabilising and sort of throwing everything up in the air and bringing it down again in a different sort of way. Although unlike a hurricane, instead of this being const destructive, it is actually incredibly, uh, 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 in incredibly constructive. Things came back together a whole lot better than they had been. So, do I do that? No. <coughs> Which one? Oh, here we are. Yeah, it's under my thing. So at the time Karen came to the Department of Medicine at Royal Melbourne Hospital, and she came from my previous department where we'd been under the prestigious leadership of Jack Martin, who I'm very delighted to see here, my old colleague, who I deserted in 1984 to join the Department of Royal Melbourne Hospital. Jack recruited Karen as a research fellow of NHMRC to REPAT, and she came across to Parkville in 1985. At that time, I think the University of Melbourne could be described as comfortable, complacent, venerable and traditional. Maybe that's still not too far <laughs> off. <laughs> it was happy, as its motto said, to be growing in the esteem of future generations. 
I just can't imagine a worse motto, worse motto for a university. I mean, as if the esteem of future generations matters. I mean, what matters is what you actually do to transform mankind. But ne never mind, esteem is what the University of Melbourne was all about at that time. And the Department of Medicine at Royal Melbourne had the esteemed, and I use that word again, Foundation uh, James Stewart Professor, recently retired after 27 years, Dick Lovell, a wonderful man, but a background, Royal Navy and St Mary's, you know, so reflecting somewhat the values of the uh, university, although I must say he was a great teacher and he got the university department at Royal Melbourne Hospital off to a wonderful foundation. But the people there were venerable also, uh, people like Priscilla Kincaid Smith, um, Ken Muirden, uh, Bob Fraser, Roger Malik, um, people who'd been there a long time in a fairly daunting sort of environment for a young professor to come. I brought with me Marjorie Dunlop and was soon joined by Joe Prieto and Geoffrey Zajac as the new breed there. And we had our smallish teams uh, entering this formidable establishment. But then Karen arrived. Her reputation came before her, and we've heard about the Kimberley, Kimberley adventure, but probably something you won't know that is absolutely fundamental to the success of that venture, and that was that Karen was the Victorian schoolgirl javelin champion. <laughs> so she took these 14 Aboriginal men from Derby who had no experience of living in uh, conditions uh, that their forebears had lived in, no ability to kill any food, and they only survived because of Karen's ability with the javelin. So there we are. <laughs> Karen is too modest to put that as a footnote to her article, <laughs> but it's absolutely the, the uh, secret of a success. What I really admired about it, apart from the science of it, and it was groundbreaking science, still quoted, although often misquoted in the context of being overwhelming support for the paleo diet, for example, whereas it was far more complex lifestyle intervention than that. But the thing I really admired is thinking of this young woman in her 30s taking 14 Aboriginal men out into the bush, uh, living with them under the same conditions for that uh, seven week period. I mean, incredibly courageous thing to do, to say nothing of the organisational skill to get these 14 people who had a varying background in an urban environment to come out and, and do that. It's just um, almost inconceivable in, in the uh, sheer um, bravery of what you did uh, together with the organisational skills. So Karen circa 1985, she was enthusiastic. So is that surprising? What's changed? I mean, she's so incredibly enthusiastic, energetic and dedicated. Those qualities of the three that I put into the words and I saw in the word map that we had various other uh, words that I'd totally endorse also, such as generous and so on. Ideas plus plus. So instead of the quiet conversations about um, hypertension and malignant hyperpyrexia that, and a little bit about bones and things that had come uh, in the, in the uh, hallowed halls of the Department of Medicine, suddenly the whole um, halls were alive with the sound of diets, but not just fat, carbohydrate and protein, but omega-3, omega-6, arachidonic acid, low GI, high GI, saturated and unsaturated, Mediterranean, etc., etc. And Karen would talk about these things with such overwhelming enthusiasm. Everyone was sort of talking about them as if um, they were the focus of all our work. Uh, forearm vascular reactivity, glucose tolerance, insulin lipids in urbanised Aboriginal communities and particularly looking at in, in the uh, Goulburn Valley at Rumbalara, uh, colleague with Charles Guest, who's now the Chief uh, Victorian Health Officer. Um, experiments in humans and rats working in collaboration with the partners. So we established a program grant uh, with me, and Karen and Joe Prieto, delighted to see you here, Joe, and uh, Marjorie Dunlop, a 
someone who uh, was an incredible contributor to, to science in the Department of Medicine for many, many years. So Karen didn't stay with us for very long, but the impact was, um, was something that lasted far beyond the years she spent with us. She was soon snapped up as the Professor of Human Nutrition at Deakin University. We continued the program grant for a total of five years, and after that five-year iteration, we had a new program grant with um, Karen replaced by Stella Clark, another hugely enthusiastic investigator. Um, Karen has made so many other contributions that you've heard about in part already, and you'll hear about a lot more that I won't go into, but I will mention one other very um, contributory um, a bit of work that uh, Karen was instrumental in. Graham Giles established a heroic uh, cohort study of over 40,000 people in their 40s to 60s studying the effect of diet on a whole range of different parameters. And uh, Karen got in early in this and mined it comprehensively for the impact of different diets on the um, outcome in terms of cardiovascular outcomes, diabetes incidence, and cancer. Uh, well, other people work mainly on the cancer incidence, but it was something that required incredible amount of work to go through all that and do that. And I think that's um, something that Karen had a number of publications about, but was uh, just hugely important to take advantage of, of that seminal study. So in summary, I've been amazed throughout by Karen's energy, her ideas, her enthusiasm. I'm uh, honoured to have been a partner and a collaborator during a short part of her career, but followed her subsequent career with admiration with the, without surprise, given that she'd already demonstrated those uh, incredible qualities when she was with us. And she did have a lasting impact, as I mentioned, on, on the Parkville Department, helped to lift it from uh, out of its complacency and create a vibrant esprit de corps. Karen, you've had a fantastic career. I've been honoured to be your friend right through that career from your days at uh, Parkville. We wish you well in your continuing uh, scientific enterprises and it's wonderful to see uh, Barbara here too. Uh, you've been a great couple over the years. So congratulations to you, to you Karen. Uh, we all share, share a little bit of a reflected glory from your contribution, and we all want to congratulate you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Richard. You know you're dealing with professionals when they stick to time in their talks. <laughs> They're all so far. So we've heard about the prophet and the preacher. We've heard about her as a leader in nutrition. And the new term that I think will go down in um, history, the uh, human hurricane. <laughs> I think that's the best I've heard yet. And now we're going to... I think everyone's been eagerly awaiting to hear what actually happened in that field study in 1982. <laughs> and Tom Wichely, who's lecturer in um, nutritional and uh, exercise science at University of SA, is going to bring us uh, into the picture. Tom? OK, so how do I know Karen? I know Karen because between 2011 and 2017, I was a postdoc and early career research fellow with, with Karen during our final days um, in uh, or pre-retirement at the University of South Australia. Now, I started the, uh, the timeline here uh, back in 1971 uh, because that's when Karen uh, received her PhD. And I'm not sure if many of you realise what her PhD was actually in. Um, here's the spine of it. The physico-chemical studies on the lactate dehydrogenase of Streptococcus cremoris. <laughs> so that was about 46 and a bit years ago. And then, uh, of course, her famous field trip happened in 1982. So somewhere in this 11-year um, this period, Karen decided that maybe she'd look at, uh, at cultures that existed outside of a Petri dish. <laughs> 
This is her 1982 field trip. So it's the therapeutic potential of the traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And Karen was kind enough to share her field notes with me and provide me with some of the photos that I'm now going to share with you today. So this is the scientific article. You've seen it a couple of times today. Um, it was published in Diabetes in 1984. The major finding was that there was a marked improvement in glucose tolerance in 10 Australian Aboriginal people with type 2 diabetes following a seven-week reversion to a traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle. This is Karen in 1982 sitting at a, a camp on, on that field trip. Uh, she's deep in conversation. Karen being Karen will probably remember every single word that happened in that particular conversation. I don't remember much from 1982. <laughs> this is why I don't remember much from 1982. <laughs> 1982 was the year I was born, so it's kind of humbling and a bit ironic that I'm presenting on the field trip today. <laughs> the field trip occurred in the, the Kimberley region of Australia, so in the, the northwest of Australia there, so it's a huge area, um, a very small population and a population density that's tiny, 0.1 persons per, per square kilometre. To put that into some comparison, Sydney's about 400 um, per square kilometre and Singapore's about 3,500. So the field trip uh, happened with people from the Mohanjum community and the Mohanjum community um, is just near Derby and the field trip itself uh, took Karen, can't point on this, but it took Karen um, and the, the participants a period of 10 days to travel up to the area of Munja on the edge of the Walcott Inlet and then uh, they went and spent two weeks there on the coast and then moved inland to the Pantajan region for three and a half weeks inland. So it was about a 600 kilometre round trip to get to Munja. Uh, of course, we all know what 600 kilometres looks like in today's uh, conditions, about a six hours drive um, on these sealed highway roads. Not really the case in 1982. So this was the bus um, that they took out uh, on the Munja track here. And there's a quote below, which I've, I've included some quotes here from Karen's field trip notes. Uh, distances covered over the first three days have been 50, 30 and 10 kilometres respectively. <laughs> here we have another photo um, of the old Ford F100 here. Um, and the quote that coincides with it is during one of the rescue operations uh, when a huge rock had to be levered out from under the F100 with the tree trunk. Now, the field trip was mostly about nutrition and diabetes, but perhaps what surprised me most was Karen's ability to be a mechanic. Um, <laughs> there are quite a number of occasions in the field trip notes where Karen makes mentions of the time she repaired the vehicle, changed batteries, replaced the sump and oil filters, dried the differential, and fixed up the cars in general. So I was very impressed to, to read this as I read through the field notes. Here's the, uh, the Kimberley Health Toyota vehicle um, loaded right up. So it said the to Toyota had never had such a loader in it, and I hope it never has to again. There were all the swags for the stock camp, all the Hessian and four men on top. <laughs> I did a bit of research and I looked at the condition of the Munja track today, and um, you can see not a lot has really changed. The track still has these big rocky jump ups uh, and water crossings. Arguably the vehicles are probably a little bit more reliable but it's still very, very tough terrain. So the, the, <laughs> the expedition was a camping expedition. Um, I'm sure some of you have gone camping like this in the modern era. I think the technical term for this is glamping or glamour camping. Um, it wasn't quite the same back in, um, in 1982, although Karen still made mention in the notes that, um, that the, it was a delightful place being around the camp apart from the flies. Uh, another common theme in Karen's journal was the flies. <laughs> she made quite a few mentions of the flies and I began to think that perhaps Karen didn't like flies particularly much. These bloody flies are driving me mad. I've never been in a place with many flies as the Colder River. Now that they're moving away from all these flies, it should be better. I felt quite fed up. I think it was the flies mainly. <laughs> the dreadful flies here are due to the donkeys and the flies likewise, although they have been definitely working longer hours at this camp the last few days. <laughs> uh, this was one of the better times at camp, so this was um, sitting around singing uh, around the bushfire at camp at night. Um, it was a scientific study, so Karen had to have a, t a 
temporary laboratory setup. Uh, she took samples, she took hair and blood samples. She also took samples of all the food that was collected as well, froze it in liquid nitrogen to be analysed later and did some of the, the glucose readings on site. Uh, so here's Karen in a makeshift laboratory um, and she's taking a finger prick blood sample there to look at glucose levels and that's the, the coinciding note from her field trip. Seven out of ten fasting blood glucose levels have normalised and that all happened relatively quickly, as um, was said earlier. Here's Karen. Uh, again, she was always a, a trendsetter, and there's no exception here. Uh, setting the trend of fashion back in the day, um, as expected, the most active ones are losing the most weight, um, making observation there about how physical activity also coincides uh, with weight status there. And you can see on the ground is a set of kitchen scales to take the weights of the participants. A uh, major part of the, the expedition was around sourcing food. Um, and so really taking the participants outside of today's modern supermarkets and outside of the convenience of being able to have food and processed food at that at hand. And so um, here's some snaps from, from Karen around the, uh, the food. So she said, we still had a, bit of, a little bit of kangaroo left. It was just about off, but after a good singe on the fire, it tasted okay. <laughs> So here is Karen eating uh, or gnawing away at a bit of, a, of campfire cooked kangaroo. Um, a lot of the food that was consumed during this field trip was fish and a lot of the, the fish was caught using bait fish um, that was in turn caught using cast nets and so we can see that in the photo here. Uh, this is a freshwater turtle uh, with the prize soup um, in the shell there after it's been cooked and I love this quote from Karen, optimism is directly proportional to how much food has just been eaten, I've decided. <laughs> and of course, once Karen's decided something, it usually <laughs> sticks, so no one is going to argue with that point. Um, the meat quality um, was touched upon earlier as well. So this is a slide Karen often shows, if you've seen some of her previous presentations. It compares the, uh, the thigh fillet of a kangaroo and the thigh fillet of a lamb. And you can see that the kangaroo meat is very, very lean um, and the, the lamb has the interstitial fat um, around it. So quite different profiles of meat between the, uh, the wild caught and the agricultural sourced meat of today. And the diet composition in this field trip was also quite incredible. So it worked out to be about 1,200 kilocalories a day, which is probably 40 to 50% less than usual intake. Um, it was extremely high energy from protein, perhaps even unsustainably high energy from protein at 50 to 80%. Um, it was relatively low or, or moderate in fat intake, um, depending on the location they're in and also fairly low to moderate in carbohydrate intake as well. So this diet composition that Karen established the health benefits against is really one that um, the high protein, low fat diet um, has been quite well recognised today and um, research, if you remember that the CSIRO total wellbeing diet was a high protein, low fat diet, although perhaps not to the extent of protein in this particular one. So she was definitely a pioneer in, in recognising some of the diets that have become popular in today's environment. So we skip forward now to another 35 years. Um, Karen's role for me has been primarily as a, a mentor. I've been extremely lucky to have her mentorship and a few people will talk later today about, um, about how she is as a mentor. So she's provided me with a, a huge amount of opportunity and, and she's enabled me to form collaborations, particularly with some of the researchers at Menzies School of Health Research, like Julie, who will speak later, and develop some of my own research output uh, in the field of Indigenous health and nutrition. Now, I'm not sure what the future holds with Karen post-retirement, but she's been a fantastic role model. So I guess if I can follow her footsteps in any way, I'll be quite happy. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Tom. So the truth is now coming out about that study. There was a rumour at one stage, there's always someone who wants to decry uh, a pioneer and an innovator, that when Karen was asleep at night, some of the people sneaked off into town and had <laughs> meat pies and, and such like. But now you've seen the roads to how to get into the campsite. <laughs> I think that's very unlikely, so we, we can quell that one. So the last uh, speakers before morning tea are Karen and Michelle Skinner. 
Are we here? Come on on and tell us um, a little bit about how you've been dealing um, with Karen over the years and where you're from. Okay? Yes, thank you. All over the earth. Well, thank you um, for the invitation to come here this morning. Um, oh, I feel so emotional right now. <laughs> yeah. um, Karen, Professor Karen, we uh, counted a privilege and an honour to be here today. Um, thank you for working with our people and teaching us a lot of things that we didn't know about lifestyle disease, um, about food. And um, she came and to our community in the 90s. And um, I guess um, she did an overhaul there, turned our lifestyle upside down, the right <laughs> way up, I guess. And, um, we just, um, Michelle and I, we uh, worked with the program in the 90s and uh, it was um, something new for us, for, the, um, for our people, because um, we just ate anything, um, like, you know, trying new foods in the store and all of that because our people, we've uh, way back when we used to work on the station, we just ha used to have uh, meat and flour and tea, the ration that the station managers gave us. But because Michelle and I worked, uh, lived and grew up in Derby, uh, we went to school there. And so, um, but we still went back to the stations and after we left school, we did the same things. But then when Professor Karen came along and uh, we learnt a lot about nutrition and lifestyle disease and so it was a very interesting uh, time for us there on the community and getting our people, even ourselves, to get a hold of what she was saying to us and we knew that it was for a better um, way of living for our people and um, we didn't really... Um, uh, 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 put anything together because we just found out that we were coming um, toward the end of December and then after that on Monday they told us oh you ladies better get ready you're going to Broome tomorrow to catch the plane to go to Melbourne so here we were we just um, like sort of trying to think what we were going to say but um, there was a lot of changes that took place in Luma. Our niece, Benno, she was the store manager at the time. And uh, she, we all worked together, the school, the community, um, the clinic, as well as the store. We had to have everybody um, working together, otherwise this program wouldn't have worked. And um, we uh, went into the, sh into the community store, we had, um, uh, diabetes educator um, Gwyneth, who's here with us today. She um, helped us to go in there. We had um, shelf talkers uh, on the shelf to show the people the better choice foods to buy. And um, we had uh, food tasting days because there was a lot of foods that we didn't know about, we had never tasted before. And um, so, the people there who uh, had type two, 2 diabetes, but um, because our people, they said, oh, well, we're not sick. You know, we haven't got diabetes, but um, when uh, they did the um, Screen. screening, they found out there were a lot of people there who had type 2 diabetes. And so the people had to learn to um, change uh, the, the, our diet, and uh, but it was harder for the men to do so because um, I guess they were so prideful yeah. to to think that um, they had this uh, 
diabetes because they weren't feeling um, ill or anything. But a lot of the women took, uh, embraced that program, went for walks, uh, did a lot of sports. Um, today, sports is the biggest thing in our community. Our um, young ladies and, uh, yeah, they play football. They won the grand final last year, um, ladies football. Even the men, you know, but, um, you know, it's thanks to what Professor Karen has taught us in the community there. The school, they still have the breakfast program. We started that off there. Um, I think it was sanitarium that um, um, donated a lot of the um, wheat bix and the milk and uh, small packets of um, uh, sultanas. Yeah. Oh, was it Diabetes Australia? Yeah. Okay. And so um, all of this happened and it's still going today in the community. And uh, Ben, I wouldn't sell any lollies or any sweet stuff there. And these people, the other um, people uh, from the um, stores in the cities, they used to ask her if they wanted her to sell all these other stuff, but she said no. She... Um, she really uh, changed the, um, the store and what they sell there. But sad to say that uh, the store is run by other people now and um, things have gone back. But you know what? What the, the people are still doing what was taught way back then in the 1980s and the children are being taught. And we even... Um, um, encourage it among our people to um, keep up with um, the diets and that. Uh, sad to say there are some people who are on um, renal dialysis, but it was, you know, we can't um, force anybody to do anything. We have to make life uh, choices ourselves, you know. People are not robots, that they have to do what we tell them to do or program whatever. But we told them that uh, they have to make this choice themselves. Whether they want to be healthy and live longer, that was their choice, you know? And, um, but a lot of people, even the younger ones today, still embrace um, what was taught way back then to their uh, grandparents. Michelle and I, we're um, grandparents or even great-grandparents, and we, uh, our children, we still... Um, Teach them in by the home example. by example. Yeah, we have to live, live it. We can't just talk to talk, but we have to walk the walk too, you know. And um, like for this morning, um, this gentleman here said he hoped that there wasn't any uh, religious people here. Well, Michelle and I were um, were um, pastors, so we forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's okay, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, it's been a wonderful journey, and thank you to Can Professor Karen. What was that? Um, Nerida Parsa. Oh, yes. Um, Nerida um, Thomas, time. the young lady that um, received um, renal transplant because, because. you um, helped her to the, get to that place. So she sent her love and said to say thank you. She couldn't come with us because of the floods. She got <laughs> cut off in Fitzroy, yeah. And um, I, I, I know Michelle wanted to speak, but she had her thyroid yeah. gland uh, removed um, not too long ago, and yeah. so her voice is not um, yeah. too good, but she's just telling me yeah. what she... <laughs> <laughs> But I'd like to say... Um, Thank you personally, Karen, because you've helped us through those years, and we haven't forgotten. And when we were asked to come, um, she and I just couldn't stop talking about all those um, sorry, precious um knowledgeable um, stuff that you gave us mm -hmm. and to live longer and you came to our community and um, we started a, 
after you left, we started living a healthy lifestyle. And a lot of people heard about it. And I don't know who, somebody donated a <coughs> troop carrier, Toyota, to our program. And we put a sign on the door, Luma Healthy Lifestyle. And we take all the people out, the old people out fishing and whatever. And then, <clears throat> I don't know if you heard of Ernie Bridge. He's passed on now. But um, he came there and when he thought the program was going down, because there are other people coming from other communities and they haven't learnt about this healthy program. So he came in and helped us for a few years because he was diabetic himself. He brought us to Melbourne to a conference here and he promoted the healthy lifestyle further by putting money into it and kept us going as long as possible. But then he passed on. But I just appreciate that people like you and him coming in and, you know, helping us with all these way of life. There were people who never knew how to eat green salads. They only had cabbage potato, onion and pumpkin. But then when we did your program, we introduced tomatoes and the green salads. Mm. And so now, and even the fruit, what was that, oh, kiwi fruit. Mm. <laughs> and I said, oh, we can't eat this. Make our tongue, I was like, no, and he said, peel it, it's something like. <laughs> <laughs> you take you take the um, shell off the bone nut, and the bone nut's all got that fluffy thing on. Oh, okay. So it was a time of educating and eating all this food that was we were introducing into what well, we all had to. Hey, yeah. but um. I just praise the Lord for Karen. You know what? I'm not diabetic. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Karen Monsieur, for those real words of wisdom, and I won't take it personally about religion. <laughs> I didn't think the nuns at St. Vincent would like to see Jesus preaching about gluten-free diets and what that was. That, that was a, uh, this, uh, I could, should call it a program. Our live program is being streamed throughout Australia, as I understand. I don't think the watchers are able to come back in and ask questions, but we've been given 10 minutes for either questions or audience participation or comment. Anyone who's really burning want to say something nice about Karen um, <laughs> um, is welcome to do so. <laughs> there we are. Here we come. Fiona, come here. We, we've got another Australian legend. <laughs> I wish I'd had your orange glasses on. Too. But, um, uh, Professor Fiona Stanley. Thank you very much. And I, I just think it has been an inspirational morning already, But um, and particularly um, with Karen and Michelle just telling us what it meant to go out and the care that you gave that community. But that wasn't my question. My question relates to the shift, and this was um, uh, what uh, Jenny was talking about, that fat was bad, but no-one was talking about sugary drinks. So when did all that start? When did the shift come when you started to realise that, in fact... They made everything low fat, but they put sugar in it to make it, and, and how de detrimental that was. It's 
on, is it? Yeah. Um, well, no, 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 that's, an, <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a really important question. And, um, and I think we... I was always uh, very suspicious of sugar. Um, I was suspicious of highly processed foods, generally. And, uh, and, I, and I didn't realise how important it was to eat sufficient protein. But, uh, um, but in fact, by... Um, by explaining to people that they should really cut down on processed foods and eat fresh foods, they were often therefore eating more fish, more lean meat, more, and having a reasonably high protein diet, which of course helps you not overeat, as I've now now learnt, and I'm sure you all know. Um, and and I think that was probably one of the very important things. But uh, yes, yeah, so sugar. No, f for years, I, I've, decades, I've been um, very suspicious of, of sugar, and read, read the fact that um, w you know very few studies that weren't quoted very much, but that actually showed that when people had sugar, it stimulated parts of the brain that made them want to eat more, and 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 so and so really trying to trying to to avoid that kind of. Um, Problem in terms of the kind of, of food that you the, that you select, but um, it was processed foods that I was really on about, not highly processed foods. So it wasn't just sugar by any means. Karen, thank you. Any anyone else want to ask Karen a, a searching question? What really happened out there? <laughs> what, what what happened at night? Uh, <laughs> flies. <laughs> flies. The flies the way. Eh? Actually, what happened at night was was very interesting. You, you, you saw one slide of, of people singing. Well, um, early on in the in the study, they played hymns. Some of the women had hymn. They had a recorder and they played hymns. And and I must say, I was absolutely thrilled when the batteries went flat and they started to <laughs> sing, um, <laughs> to actually sing the, um, their their traditional songs. Yeah. And that was wonderful. And, uh, and then they'd explain to me what they were. You know, they'd translate them for me. And I remember there was one that, uh, that went on and on and on. And I asked, uh, what, what were you singing about? With the dawn come the flies. To <laughs> 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 pit, to pit. Karen Michelle, pity Karen didn't have Ernie Bridges there. He would have been singing all night and on his... He, he was a great figure. I think he was the first Indigenous member of Parliament in Western Australia, wasn't he? Yeah, that's true. And he, he was on the same track as you guys. Did you know Ernie at all? Oh, I yeah, mean, I didn't he... know him well, but, but he wanted me to actually uh, uh, to write a recommendation letter to Luma for yeah. him. Yeah. So <laughs> I, that was about as much as I did, yeah. Karen, how much weight did you lose on the trip? And just remember that story about when um, when a beast was killed and how everyone could feast, but you struggled with that. Well, I lost eight kilograms, um, and you know I got down to about what I am now, uh, and so I obviously had weight to lose, so that was okay. Um, and uh, I used to, I I couldn't. Um, when an animal was killed, people would sit down and they'd cook it and then they'd gorge, you know, they'd just slice, not gorge in a nasty way at all, but they'd just slowly slice off bits of meat, you know, kangaroo leg and that kind of thing and eat and eat. And I just couldn't do that. So I used to, and they learnt this pretty quickly, that they would, they would cut me off a piece to keep for breakfast <laughs> <laughs> because I always wanted to eat something in the morning. So it was, yeah, look, you know, they were very tolerant of different habits. Jenny. Um, I wondered about Randy's name. Was it a nickname? No. <laughs> no. Oh. No, his name was Randolph people, Spargo. <laughs> yes. And uh, he, it was shortened to Randy. Mm. <laughs> and I don't know that much about his personal life. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lisa Jamison, University of Adelaide, nice to see you again. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, in this day and age, it would be really hard to get all the ethical approvals, all the sort of processes. Oh, exactly. That. How did you manage to do that side of it? Well, uh, you're <coughs> absolutely right. I think it would be impossible to, to do today. And what I needed was support from Kimberley Health. And Randy Spargo was head of, of, the, of West Kimberley Health. And he was very enthusiastic about this kind of thing. He was very supportive. There was an anthropologist early on. Hmm? 
Oh, it'd just be, well, it'd be, I don't think it'd be impossible because um, I didn't take any food out. I mean, some people did, but, but then it soon went. And, and that, but the point is if we'd had, and so that wouldn't be, I, I think that wouldn't be an acceptable thing now, but, um, but it was, yeah, I think I was very lucky, that's true. <laughs> and I wanted to go out for three months because um, the previous study had gone out for three months. But what used to happen with, with that study, uh, it, the, the anthropologist used to go home on the weekends because his wife was pregnant and were all very understandable. And then people would come in from Derby with, with extra food. <laughs> so, so, but people still lost weight because five days out of seven, they were eating a lot less. And that's, and we know now, five plus, the two plus five. <laughs> it, it's the other way around. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, yes, I, I, uh, so I, I think um, it certainly wouldn't be possible now that you, you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, so I think I, I was very lucky and I'm glad that I could do it because uh, it did tell an important story and important message. And although people hadn't lived off the land for a long time, there were a number there who had hunted and gathered. There was one, <laughs> one man who had lived off the land for... 10 years at one stage. He was on the run, apparently. And, uh, <laughs> and he was... And we couldn't have survived without him because he knew the country so well and we went out to, his, to where he knew and, and it was just fantastic. So, um, yeah, the, uh, uh, yeah he, was, and he was just really wonderful. And in town, he was a drinker, but in the bush, as soon as he got out there, and I noticed this with so many people, as soon as they got out bush, they were just ready to um, go and, and hunt and gather uh, and excited about it. So it really, that, and that, I couldn't write about that uh, directly, but it was a very important observation. So Karen said she didn't want to speak today, but we were, <laughs> we're, we, we, we've given her a chance. Um, Karen, thank you. What we, uh, it, sorry, did we have, no. So... We are going to break for morning tea. Unfortunately, the people on the streaming out there in the outback and such like, you've got 30 minutes yourself to go and have a drink somewhere. Alex Brown and I actually just came back from Wyala yesterday. The temperature was 42 degrees, so I'm sure some of the people, people watching aren't in a cool environment like us. But anyhow, we're going to break for about 25 minutes and get everyone back here about... Um, 11.10, oh no, 11.40 for the next session. And thank you very much so far to those who have already spoken. Thank you.